how do you kind of mentally like shift these puzzle pieces around until you go like, all right, that's a thing I can get behind that parallels this, but is not um, repulsive to, you know, human beings with empathy and compassion. So some of that is like what in the planning stages for taking Jan, it's like, he thinks he's Danny Ocean, you know, he thinks he's like Steve McQueen and this is a heist. And, um, and that's a fun, exciting thing to get behind, you know, like make it a hundred million dollars. Don't make it a little girl. Um, you know, like replacement things like that, that offer you the same like intention and drive and complexity and enthusiasm that he experienced, but without having to find a way for me as Jake to be like, how do I convince myself to think exactly as he thought, you know? So it is, it's a mindset, but yeah. yeah. Thank you very much. <laughs> well, welcome, everyone. Jake, I can't say that it's good to see you. <laughs> yeah, sure. That's, that's understandable, yeah. Uh, you were just, is this on? Is this work? Okay. Um, you were just saying backstage that it has now been coming up on a year since you got involved in this project. Yeah. Yeah. It was about a, a, just like a calendar year ago that I first spoke to Jan, I guess, and really to Nick and, and Eliza about uh, this project happening and coming on board and um, what their vision was and maybe how I could uh, be a part of that, I suppose. Yeah. So how familiar were you with the story before you got involved and then did you have any hesitation about getting involved? Um, I'd seen the documentary. It took me, I think, two weeks of like speaking with them and reading the material uh, for someone to go like, you know, that's the same story, right? Like this is this is a continuation or a new uh, way to tell that story from kind of inside the family's perspective. Um, and I didn't have a hesitation really, you know. I, um, I just want to work on good things and Nick's writing was so fantastic and the fact that Jan and uh, her mother were Marianne were a part of this both creatively and as producers on this um, I think assuaged a lot of concerns about what are we doing making this you know like is this just voyeuristic and kind of saying like look at the freak show look at the you know like look at how grisly this is and um, and it's clearly not is saying like um, let's talk about how you end up making choices that are against your best interests, you know, things that from the outside, it's easy to go like, Oh my God, I would never allow that. I would, I would call these people. I would say this, I would cut this person out of my life. And yet all of it happened, you know? So how do you explain that? Um, so I didn't, I didn't, I didn't have any concern of like, I'll be seen a certain way. I just thought like, we maybe can do something special here culturally and then also creatively and um yeah jen wrote you a letter before production correct yeah can you tell us about what was in that letter and kind of the impact that it had on you as you entered into making the show yeah jan uh she wrote each of the cast members a, a letter and um she had been available it was known to us that she was like a, a, a resource you know if we wanted to reach out and speak to her and I was concerned that, um, I was just scared, you know? I, I was concerned that like having a, a relationship with her, a friendship, anything, I would, uh, it would be even harder to play Birchtold, you know? And um, so she wrote this wonderful note and the first half said, you know, B was warm and charming and uh, generous and funny and a great storyteller and, and that that was his superpower. And, uh, and the back half of this note said, um, like, I'm in a healthy place and uh, you're great for this role and I'll be championing you from the sidelines and uh, like, go for it. You know, you don't have to worry about having two priorities of, of trying to do right by this material and then somehow indirectly protecting me from the trauma of what happened in the 70s, you know? And um, that was like a, a gift that I, was in awe of then and, and still am that like, I didn't know I <laughs> needed that permission of, of someone to say like, it's okay. Like, I'm all right. You can do this. Um, if you get the chance to see 
or, you know, in person or like online to see Jan speak about any of this and her process through this being creatively involved, like I, I would highly recommend it. She is a remarkable, remarkable person. And uh, yeah, I'll just forever be in her debt for that. And did you work with her or with Marianne more extensively after that? No, I think, you know, I still kept my distance in terms of, of uh, you know, h how I wanted to approach B and, and this sort of like private insular thing that he's, you know, fantasy that he's built for himself, I suppose. But my fear of, um, of having like a closeness or a friendship with her somehow putting me at a distance from B um, was kind of the opposite. It's like, it gave me more freedom and intention to go like, oh, let's really go all in on trying to get this right for Jan. You know, like it, it connected me, Jake, in a personal way to her and her intentions for this that then hopefully, you know, translates into like a better quality work than kind of having, you know, the hamster wheel in the back of just like whatever neuroses and doubt you have going on to be like, oh, am I doing this right? Is there a right? How should I book? Oh, God, what are we doing here? You know? Um, yeah. Uh, so I also watched the documentary Abducted in Plain Sight, the 2017 Netflix documentary is what we were talking about. Um, and it seems like, well, at least some of the criticism that came out after that was people, as you kind of touched upon being like, oh, I would have acted differently or like, how did they not see which is which is a lot to come out to begin with, but it does feel like this series was made kind of with that specific response in mind and addressing it directly. So can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I think, um, you know, like people talk about this show as being true crime and in a sort of like technical way it is because it's true and there's clearly crime happening. Uh, you know, so like it fits, but... Um, I think a lot of true crime focuses on the, the predator, the perpetrator, and tries to say, like, why is this person the way they are? And how did they get to be this kind of soulless void of a, a being? And and this really focuses on the family. It focuses on Jan. It says, like, well, let's start where this evil thing exists, and that's a given. And then let's see what happens when that thing just infiltrates and weaves its way into the fabric of your life to a point where you have been nudged two degrees, two degrees, two degrees, two degrees, until you get to a place where you think, like, I, I don't recognize myself. I don't know how I got here. I don't know why I'm making these choices. I can't extract myself from this person's pull I keep going back I keep believing them I keep trusting them and um so I think some of that for Jan I think was to <laughs> she has said like when people after the documentary were saying what terrible parents and and her response was like no 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 I have the best parents like the only reason I'm here today after suffering this abuse at the hands of Robert Birchtold is because of my family like that's the takeaway. There's one predator here, and that's Birchtold. You know, like, it, it's not a confluence of circumstances that you can blame. There's one person who did these terrible things. And I think psychologically, um, narratively, Nick was much more on board with doing that than saying, like, why is someone a pedophile? Is like, do we, is there value in exploring that? Like, what or why would you do that, you know? Um, so I think, you know, I hope that answers the question. Well, and to that same end, I know you've talked a lot about how you were not interested in really getting into Birchtold's headspace and justifying his actions, right? You know, like that's a tricky thing to answer because I don't, I don't want to say, like I, I, I did not want to be in the specifics of his headspace. You know, like I didn't want to find some way to go like, how how do you convince yourself you're attracted to a child? You know, like, that is not a thing I care to ever attempt. Um, and I, uh, you know, performance-wise, it just doesn't serve the story because when I venture down that road mentally, I'm immediately repulsed. And for him, 
it's the thing he wants most. So it's more like how do you get into the um, the obsession, you know, this like remove the specific of like the thing he's obsessed with is a preteen girl and say like how do you kind of mentally like shift these puzzle pieces around until you go like, all right, that's a thing I can get behind that parallels this, but is not um, repulsive to, you know, human beings with empathy and compassion. So some of that is like what in the planning stages for taking Jan, it's like, he thinks he's Danny Ocean, you know, he thinks he's like Steve McQueen and this is a heist. And, um, and that's a fun, exciting thing to get behind, you know, like make it a hundred million dollars. Don't make it a little girl. Um, you know, like replacement things like that, that offer you the same like intention and drive and complexity and enthusiasm that he experienced, but without having to find a way for me as Jake to be like, how do I convince myself to think exactly as he thought, you know? So it is, it's a mindset, but yeah. Thank you very much. <laughs> someone also, someone sneezed up there, and I thought they were gagging, and I was like, oh, okay. Is everyone okay? Is it <laughs> just a sneeze? Okay, great. Like both were justified. It's fine. Both <laughs> are fine. There's also there's definitely layers to the performance. You know, he is a, a psychopath, as we learn in later episodes much more clearly, like explicitly, um, and a con man. You know, you say he has this kind of Steve McQueen fantasy and all of that. So with that distance in mind as an actor, where do you begin to carve out this performance? You, like from the start, sort yeah. of? Where did, like, where did you start? You were like, okay, I'm gonna oh. break him down, I'm gonna do the, the the charming part, which you have a lot of experience with, or That's the psycho kind. part. I, <laughs> or the psycho part, yeah, which I have loads of experience with. Um, I think, you know, like Colin and I, Colin Hanks, who wonderful as as Bob Broberg talked a lot on set about like um just like stabbing in the dark you know like um you're just trying to like gather as much as you can and try to see like what sticks you know and and um we shot for six seven months and so you just have to have like a a Mary Poppins level bag of like stuff to pull from to continue to connect to and to to stay like organic and so um, it was a mix it was you know some was like any information that I could get really through Nick and and Jan about the specifics of Birch Told's life and his upbringing and you know the timeline for his relationship with Gail their age difference um, his abuse as a child, his being caught abusing relatives when he was young, you know, a number of things to c build some specific picture of him. Um, the wonderful material that Nick had laid out, you know, that ultimately like you're there in service of that to, to fulfill that, um, an understanding of manipulation and coercion and uh, gaslighting within intimate relationships. And then also, you know, reading like, Lolita, um, to sort of be, to just go like, does this click? Does this offer any anything of value in then approaching the material? And, um, you know, and then along the way, it sort of reveals itself as well. Like, that's the other, I, I found like, truly just taking it piecemeal and saying like, what are we, what are we shooting today? <laughs> you know, like, what is this moment? And in a probably like, helpful way it's like that's what birch told is doing as well is very like how close or how far am i getting from this goal you know and like moment by moment that is changing and so uh so are his tactics and so part way sorry to just answer 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 but um but i liked working on this um the there's you know rachel goldberg was directing and it's the second episode i think and um we're doing this scene where I'm I'm trying to get Marianne like back in my orbit essentially and she's come to the motor home and um I hit her with like eight different things like trying to seduce her, trying to guilt her, shame her, bring up her kids, bring up our future, live in this fantasy together, care for her, give her, you know, 
and Nick was like, how's it going? I was like, ah, it doesn't feel very good. I don't think we're like doing a good job with this scene. You know, it feels just weird. And he and Rachel were like, you know, you're looking for something organic, like human in between these, how to go from one to the next. And the reality is that this guy is uh, devoid of that, that he's just shamelessly like, bam, 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 until someone submits, until he finds the thing that clicks and then goes like, all right, let's hit that, you know, and goes down that path to whatever end. Um, so, you know, that's two months into filming to go like, oh, <laughs> great. Let's remember that for three months from now when a thing feels inorganic and, and go like, maybe it doesn't have to be built out of my understanding of, of how people behave. It can be purely built out of what this guy is, you know? So it's some mix of, of trying to like lay this foundation and, and then just like setting sail and being like, here we go. Yeah. Uh, I'm so glad you brought up that scene with Anna though. That is one of the standout scenes in the entire show, I think, um, where she approaches you in the motorhome. And then also you have a scene later with Colin, just the way that he separates the family and is mentally, emotionally, sexually preying upon everybody is so fascinating. And I think one of the things that the series um, really succeeds at. So how did you, again, you're kind of portraying all these different versions of B to all of them. So can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah. You know, again, like some of that is like a shamelessness or, or, uh, this obsessive, like kind of blinders on, like for each person, he had an ability to figure out like the thing they needed most, you know, that Bob had, uh, you know, desires for intimacy with other men that probably weren't, uh, fulfilled. And he figured out, pretty early on that he could fulfill that for him, you know, um, that Marianne wasn't getting the attention in her relationship that she wanted and that he could like make her feel special and like swept off her feet in a way that her life wasn't, uh, offering her at that time, you know, and, um, that for Jan, he could offer up, you know, this adult world, this world of like, there's more outside, you know, of Pocatello than, than you can know. And that he's the, the key for that. Um, and that with each of those people, he's shamelessly playing that character for them. You know, um, Jan just said, we were, uh, we were on like a group thing yesterday, a group call. And she's like, I'm, she's like, I'm going through my mom's stuff. And you know, they still have, she talks about having like recipe cards that say like Gail Birch told, she's like, this woman was so close. Like she taught me how to, you know, make food that I still make at Thanksgiving. It's like, we were so, so close, you know? And, and she was like, I found a note from B to my dad, this, you know, to her father. And this is in early 76. So it's four months before B takes her again. And Bob has completely cut Birch told out of his life and Birchtold has sent a card that says, sometimes you meet someone that's so special, they reveal who you are to yourself. And then signed it, thinking of you, B. This is to a person who he's had a sexual relationship with, has destroyed his marriage, taken his child, and has been entirely cut out of his life, and is still sending a card that he knows will go, you're so special, and you're special to me. And you're like, oh my, like, what the fuck is this? Like, you know, uh, like a, a brazen, staggering, shameless uh, attempt to like continually pull people in. And so it, you kind of, you know, there was a freedom to be like, go for it. A freedom on set to be like, you don't have to play by the rules of everyone else because he doesn't play by the rules of everyone else, you know? Yeah. That is... I need like a second to recover no, from that. I mean, we were on Nick. It was like an interview thing and like we're on Zoom and it's all that, you know, and Jan's like telling us and Nick and I are both like, yeah, like, from like what? and Nick's like, that's four, that's four months before, you know, it was like doing the math in the story. I was like, wow. Yeah. Jan, Jan is so impressive in the way that she can like speak about all of this too. Her, I, you know, I haven't been through any kind of trauma in the way that Jan has been and the way that she 
carries herself like she is so alive and energized and hopeful and present and it's like she's remarkable nothing short of of remarkable truly um, and then what was it, the experience like working with the young gents with Hendrix and McKenna? You know, I've said like Colin and Anna and Leo and myself can like offer up the very best performance we can give. And um, and it just won't matter if if the young and then slightly older Jan like don't click. You know, like the show really lives and dies on on those two girls and uh, on Hendrix and, and McKenna. And um, I just think the world of both of them, it was um, on the first day when we shot, you know, we we're doing like screen tests or all in hair and makeup and wardrobe for the first time. And I hadn't met Hendrix. And, uh, you know, I was saying like, you do all this research and you read all these scripts and, the, you know, just trying to kind of be in that world and the thing. And then all of a sudden you're in the clothes and the hair and you go like, okay, this is where we're really getting going here. And like came onto the sound stage and uh, Hendrix was there and I came around the corner and she like looked up and she goes, well, hi, B, I'm Jan. And like put her hand up and it was like, it was the first of many, but the first time in the production that I was like, oh, fuck. Like this is, oh, fuck. Like, <laughs> Right, right. That's what that's the story we're telling here. Is like this this girl with this incredible light and brightness to her that like you can't teach a person, you know, that just is like shines through her and then this guy tried to take it. You know, like that's the thing that he was sexually attracted to and tried to steal. Like that that was the first moment where I thought like I don't know if I want to do this. I don't know if this is I don't I'm not sure about this. And um and like her <laughs> like I think they both, you know, Hendrix offers up like a performance that I don't I couldn't probably do now and and I'm 25 years older than she is. And the same with McKenna where like you know, I was speaking to someone and they were like so impressive for someone her age. And I was like, dude, impressive for anyone, any age. Like uh, it's the, the, <laughs> by the time McKenna comes in, she is dealing with seven different layers that are like each is a vice, just like continually grinding her down. And, uh, I just think the world of her, I mean that her, her performance is, is remarkable. Um, yeah, I, that's yeah. I can't say enough good things about those two. So we have a series over at IndieWire where I work called My Favorite Moment. I might be like scooping my own future work here, but um, I'm curious to know. It's hard to, it's difficult with like more serious subject matter to be like, oh, this was my favorite or this was so fun. Yeah, yes. But what stands out is maybe the way to phrase it. It could be a scene. It could be behind well, the scenes. It could be <laughs> as a viewer. My my one of my favorites is um, it's like uh, it's before the abduction. It's when um, uh, B has taken Jan to go horseback riding in American Falls, and uh, you know Marianne said yes, and Bob said no, and and um, and Marianne has said like, well, you could take her, but you're allergic to horses. And he's like, I know I'm allergic to horses. You know, like, I'm aware. And in the background, you hear one of the daughters being like, B is so funny. And uh, and Colin is like at the table and does this thing where he's like, <sighs> like, just like sick of having to hear about it. You know, like just tired of being like, yeah, that guy's so cool, man. Like, we get it. We get it, Susan. <laughs> Um, like that little bit of like joy and comedy in an otherwise very like heavy, dark thing. I was like, ah, oh, that's fantastic. Um, and maybe my, like, I don't know, favorite moment. Um, can I plant one? Yeah, please. Yes, There's, sure. um, in one of the later episodes you, when you're in the hospital and you, get the note oh sure and you just like let loose that was for me a big moment of watching and being like that's who this character really is yeah also that so if anyone uh, you know i guess spoiler i don't what did you just watch now <laughs> it happened 50 years ago well i'll how do we talk around he, he's in, he gets a note that he's excited about i'm in a uh <laughs> it's 
Yeah, I'm in a. Yeah, I guess there's two options. I can just blow it straight up for you, or try to walk around it. If there's any way to just get go spoiled, right into it, this is the way. Have Jake Might do it do for ear you. Might want to do earmuffs. Okay. Um, so I've been uh, convicted, and uh, but the totality of my sentencing is to go to um, a psychiatric facility, and um, and I start a relationship with a nurse there, which. In reality, um, I went on to Birch told went on to date her for years and abuse her daughter from the ages of 12 to 17, after abusing Jan and and you know easily a dozen other girls. So that's just that continues on, um, and that's just to bum you out. That's not doesn't even matter for this moment. It's just to make you <laughs> pissed off. Um, but in this scene, I'm uh, uh, writing. I'm at the typewriter, claim to be writing my second novel, which is a lie. And um, the nurse comes in and she says, "You had these visitors, and I, you know, I, I have, unbeknownst to her, hired two convicts that I met while awaiting sentencing to burn down Bob's flower shop." Which again, all like all true. Not an embellishment. Not a thing that like Nick and the writers came up with. That's what happened. <laughs> And so I'm in this psych ward and she, you know, I say, oh, it's, you know, probably my lawyer. I got my, you know, ex is running around with some clown and I got a kid with disabilities and, you know, like creating a sob story for her. And she says, oh, I'm raising one of my own. And she slips me the note, even though she's supposed to give it to my doctor. And it just says, did it. And uh, she leaves. And there's this moment where it was scripted as, um, you know, he uh, that I dance. And, uh, and I talked to Nick and I was like, you know, I feel like if we're going to do a dance, it should be like, if you've seen, uh, Mad Men, I hope it's, this isn't another spoiler for you. Um, if you've seen Mad Men, when Bert dies and, and Don gets into the elevator and then Bert comes down the stairs and sings that beautiful number and you go like, what is happening here? Um, this has just become a one-on-one -on -one conversation at this point, <laughs> but, um, you know, and it's like surreal. It just is like this beautiful moment where like time space breaks and Don can't figure out what is happening. And then he gets in the elevator and it's over, you know? And I was like, I think if we're going to do a dance, it's got to be that it's got to be like, and you are like inside his thing for a minute before you snap back to like this facility. But this was on the day of filming, and he was like, we're probably not going to do that. Like, we don't have the music or the choreography, so let's get real. And, uh, and I was like, then I think the response is, like, explosive. You know, that it's not, there isn't, like, a, a sort of uh, soft shoe, like, Fred Astaire um, expression. Like, genuinely, you know, like, uh, this expression of, like, floating on air as much as, like, this, like, animalistic, like, are we allowed to swear? It's too, it's way too late. You said fuck several, oh, said times. several times. Yeah. <laughs> you know that he's just like, I fucking own you. Like, I, like, you're mine. Like, everything that's yours is mine. Like, this fire in him to, like, ever increase the space he takes up and the control he has. And so then that became this thing where, like, they give me the note and then I have this crazy, like, like jumping, ranting, like, like in. He's the like he's like thing. kicking his legs up to his butt when he like getting air. That was great, and we did it a bunch of times. And initially, it was like silent because I'm in the psych ward, and I was like, I, you know, he's like having this explosive thing, but doesn't want to draw attention. And then in you know post, we went back, and they were like, because your mouth is open, you should. So we added this little like, like vocal fry thing that then like matches up with it and. It's a nuts moment. Like they sent it to me for the, you know, to put on Instagram and be like, tonight's the finale. And I was like, oh, that's a big moment. Like, I hope this works. You know what I mean? Like, whoo, that's, we took a swing there. But, uh, but it is like in the, both in the course of that scene, you know, it starts with him kind of like, this is old school, but like making eyes at the nurse and then ends in this like fury tantrum. Uh, and also, like, in the arc of this story, like, he starts as, like, a, hey, come on in, like, suburban dad. And then you see him, all of the crazy shit he's done, and then to get to this point where it's, like, oh, this guy's 
like the true thing inside is this like burning thing to just like take over you know yeah so that, that yes that's a that's a that was a uh, I guess what's so cool about that moment is I'll probably never get to have that again. As an actor, you know what I mean? You go like, I'll probably never have a scene like that. I think I'm almost at, how are we on time? Can we do another, maybe? Okay. <laughs> um, I'm curious, so just like kind of a final note, what you hope people take away from this series now with the, the finale out and sort of wrapped up. You know, I feel like, um, I feel like, you know, my job here is just to, like, fulfill Nick's wonderful material and to do right by Jan and her family. You know, that, like, they're the people who came to this with intention and maintained that intention and motivation through the entirety of, like, writing, pre-production, production, post-production. Post -production. And I'm just a little piece in that to try to make that as real as possible so that their thing can kind of take off. And um, I haven't seen the finale, but in post saw the final moments. Um, and it's going to be another spoiler. But uh, OK, then I won't do it. Then I won't do it. <laughs> I take it back. Um, I'll just say that like the the. The show ends uh, with hope in a way that it, I think, and this isn't, you know, back padding because I had nothing to do with it. This is really just credit to Nick and Alex and Jamie and, and Lauren who directed the episode and uh, to Jan and um, is that it ends organically uh, with hope, you know, and um, and ends in a way that to me, like as a viewer in that moment, you think like you can have a life after the abuse, you know, that Jan has said, like, this doesn't have to define me. I've gone on to have a fulfilling, beautiful life after this. And for her, through her book, her foundation, through the telling of the story in this manner, you know, narrative, uh, limited series, is to say that, like, these horrific things happen and then we get a chance to, to move on. And I think a lot of shows that are within this genre of crew, true crime, if that's right for this, uh, end with like, he got the electric chair and that's supposed to be like the resolution. And it just leaves me at least like angry and empty and think like, why did I put time into watching this? Like, that's already hard enough to be a person. Why did I do that? And, um, and this like gives you... <laughs> I'm just proud to be a part of a thing that gives you a ramp up, you know, out of it, as opposed to just ending with despair after eight and a half episodes of going like, God damn, it can't get worse than that. It can't. Um, so I hope that that's the takeaway. I hope like that I was fortunate enough to piggyback onto other people's intention and be a part of it. Um, full stop. Yeah. Well, it's a very powerful series. You're excellent in it. All of Friend of the Family is now streaming on Peacock, so you can spoil or not spoil yourself at your leisure. Jake, thank you so much. Thanks and thank so you all much. of you thank for you. being here. Thanks a lot. Thank you.